Darian Hudson was born on January 1, 1994 in Hutchinson, Kansas. Known affectionately as D and D Baby, her younger siblings and their mother, Stephanie Hudson, were a close-knit unit and were in constant contact with each other via phone and social media. Those who knew Darian remember her most for her smile, which never failed to brighten their days. Bubbly and fiercely loyal, she was always there for those she cared about most, and she used her bright personality to work toward the long-held goals she had for herself. On October 21, 2017, Darian called her mother to share with her that she was hoping to bounce back from the difficult year she'd been having. She was looking to move back home to Kansas, in the hopes of saving money, and was planning on attending nurse school. Her family last had contact with the 23-year-old on October 22, 2017. On October 25, 2017, Stephanie began to receive calls and texts from Darian's friends, inquiring about her whereabouts. They informed her that she'd failed to show up for work and they'd been unable to locate her. Concerned, Stephanie and her husband drove to Stillwater and went directly to the city's police department. However, they were told they needed to wait 48 hours before filing a missing persons report. While they waited to file the report, the two started canvassing Darian's neighborhood in the 500 block of West 5th Street. They also spoke with her friends. When they arrived at her duplex, they found the door was open, a light had been left on and there were dishes in the sink. They also located her cell phone and other belongings in the residence. On October 28, 2017, two days after the family arrived in Stillwater, the official investigation into Darian's disappearance began. To kick off their investigation, officers interviewed Darian's friends, family, co-workers and neighbors. Through these discussions, they were able to rule out those close to her as having any involvement. Bus records were reviewed, as she didn't own a vehicle, and showed no indication that Darian had used the Greyhound, Jefferson Lines, BOB system or any form of public transit at the time of her disappearance. In early December 2017, investigators were alerted to a man attempting to use Darian's debit card at a hotel in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. When interviewed, he stated he'd found the card in a purse back in October that it had been hung off a concrete sewer pipe at a church construction site in Stillwater. At the time, St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church was under construction at the intersection of McElroy Road and Country Club Drive, just northwest of the city. Following up the lead, officers were sent to the site to interview those working on the site. They recalled seeing a woman matching Darian's description on the evening of October 26, 2017. They said she'd been sitting in a wooded area just south of the site. When two workers approached her, she refused to speak and simply gave them both a blank stare. Concerned, they told their boss, who went to talk to her, but again, could not get her to speak. They did not call 911 or inform anyone of this occurrence. Investigators were able to locate two others who could corroborate this sighting. One witness said they'd seen a woman sitting on construction equipment that evening, as if she'd been waiting for someone to pick her up. Another, a man whose residence bordered the east side of the construction site, said he'd seen a woman speaking with his grandchildren that day. According to his statement, his grandson had gotten off the school bus and saw the woman walk out of the nearby creek and through an electrified fence. However, by the time the man was able to reach his grandchildren, the woman was gone, walking north to McElroy Road and then west toward Country Club Drive. This is the last known sighting of Darien. Based on these sightings, investigators utilized drones and brought in cadaver dogs to search the wooded area south west and east of the intersection for two days between December 4 and 5, 2017. While they were able to locate Darian's hooded sweatshirt in her wallet, which contained her ID, credit cards, and money, they were unable to find any trace of the missing woman. There have been no other sightings of Darian. 
She has also not accessed her social media or bank account since her disappearance, and police say there are no substantial updates in the case. Darian's friends and family have dedicated numerous social media posts to the case, in the hopes of keeping it alive and in the public eye. They have also posted flyers in the area where she was last seen, asking residents to contact the Stillwater Police Department if they have any information regarding her whereabouts. The police department teamed up with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation's Cold Case Unit to feature Darian's case on a cold case playing card. The deck containing the card was distributed to local jails and prisons, in the hopes an inmate with information would come forward with information. According to investigators, the case is still open and active. While they acknowledge it's possible Darian met with foul play and that the case is suspicious, they have not uncovered any evidence that would lead them to believe that theory over any other. It is currently the only outstanding missing persons case for the department. Darian's family and friends feel foul play is involved in her disappearance, as they don't believe she would have left without telling them. They hope investigators will take a closer look at the case and those who were in her life at the time she went missing. Darian's family has created various social media profiles to help promote awareness for the case. Along with dedicated Facebook and Twitter accounts, they also maintain a website that features any and all developments. Stephanie says that Darian's siblings keep her going, as she wants to be strong for them. Tracy Diane Waterfield was born January 5, 1960 in Canadian, Texas to James and Sandra Waterfield with an older brother named Ricky Waterfield and younger sister Cindy Young. Growing up she was a happy girl who was succeeding in her school life and was successful in sports. Upon graduating at the top of her class she applied for school at Oklahoma State to study physical therapy and focused on working with those with disabilities. Tracy was described as a fun girl who loved to cook, loved people, she would stay busy and loved life. She had met Jeffrey Nielsen on a blind date and they fell in love instantly, they married on July 26, 1980 and moved in together in Moore, Oklahoma. On January 5, 1981, five months after her wedding, Tracy Nielsen was turning 21. This day would not be filled with joy, presents, and cake however. This was the day Tracy Nielsen was brutally murdered in her home. On the morning of January 5th, Tracy's husband Jeffrey left the home to attend classes at the university since he was studying to become an orthopedic surgeon Tracy started her day as usual, running errands and neighbors could see her doing chores around noon. Her family started to call her in the afternoon to wish her a happy birthday but their calls went unanswered. After classes had completed Jeffrey went to Oklahoma City to search for a gift for his wife's birthday. Upon buying her a bottle of expensive perfume he returned home to surprise Tracy and make them a lobster dinner around 5 p.m. When he arrived at the home the TV had been left on, an ironing board and iron remained set up in the living room, but there was no sign of his wife. He called out for her and still received no response and started looking around for her, as he went back to the bedroom he found her lying face up on their bed, barefoot with a pair of blue jeans and a plaid shirt on, her throat was slit and she had multiple stab wounds to her upper body. Jeffrey would talk about this moment decades later and describe it as, a horrible day, during, his, first years at medical school, he dissected, cadavers, but nothing prepar, at him, for that, it was absolutely horrible. He then describes going, crazy for a minute, with grief before running from the home and down the street to his friend's home to call the police. An autopsy would later show that she had been stabbed over 20 times but not been sexually assaulted. The apartment had no signs of forced entry but Jeffrey had noticed that the front door had been left unlocked when he arrived that evening. There were no signs of a robbery or struggle in the home and crime scene photos of this case look eerily normal. 
Police were able to rule out Jeffrey quickly as they had proof he had been at the university and stores all day so they started the investigation by interviewing the neighbors, two of which reported seeing a man in the neighborhood. One neighbor described him as being in his late 20s, 5 feet 9 inches, around 155 pounds with curly dark brown hair and a day's growth of beard. The other neighbor described the man as being in his early 30s, 5 feet 10 inches, 150 to 170 pounds, with military short hair and sideburns. A man meeting either of these descriptions has never been arrested or found tied to this case and the murder weapon has never been recovered either. The only evidence that has turned up was a single fingerprint that has never been identified and a receipt that had been left with Tracy for cable work that had been done at the house on the day of the murder. It indicated that the work had been scheduled around 11.51 am and the initials of the worker were haphazardly scribbled onto the form, not resembling anything useful either. But with this, police felt they had a lead and checked with companies to see who had been scheduled to go to the Nielsen's home. The cable and telephone companies confirmed however that they had not sent anyone to their home and that the ticket book the receipt had come from belonged to workers with the Bell Telephone Company that is a subsidiary to AT&T. These ticket books do not have any identifying codes or markings on them so there was no way to identify who the receipt had come from. 34 years later the police went public with the few theories this presented, either the suspect was a worker for the Bell Telephone Company, or the ticket book had been stolen and was used by the murderer to gain entry into people's homes. During this announcement in 2015 police also revealed what is their final hope to finding Tracy Nielsen's murderer, a keychain. Tracy had a tortoise shell colored keychain that was 1 inch wide by 4 inches long and had her name inscribed on it in golden color lettering. Police revealed that the keychain had been the only thing missing from the crime scene and believed that the killer might have taken it as a prize. They felt that this keychain was the key to finding the killer and offered a $100,000 reward raised by the families for anyone with information on the case. However over the years police have tracked down 1,600 leads and still have not gotten anywhere. Jeffrey Nielsen's family assisted the police even years after the murder to pass a law that would implement the fingerprint identification system that later helped solve hundreds of other violent crimes across Oklahoma, but when the fingerprint that had been found at the crime scene had been compared to the database no match was found. The family still mourns this tragedy and Jeffrey feels that this crime had likely been random since no one would target Tracy. This leaves the family terrified and questioning where such rage could come from. Jeffrey feels that, time dampens the severity of the pain, but that he does not know what closure would mean for him or his family and that perhaps knowing what happened to Tracy would help them heal psychologically. Jeffrey is now around 60 and has since moved away from Oklahoma to pursue his career in Texas.